Great. Thanks so much for the invitation to speak here today. And thanks so much to everyone from the science writing community for being here today. I know that uh, especially for those of you working in the field of infectious diseases or anything in that topic, this has been a really crazy year. So we really appreciate you all coming out here today and fitting this into your schedules. All right, so uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, the human touch and in infectious disease models. And I'll tell you a bit more about what I mean by that shortly. So despite all the advances of uh, 20th and now 21st century science, infections are still a major contributor to deaths and disease around the world. So we're all familiar by now with the devastating toll that COVID-19 has taken around the world um, with nearly 4 million deaths reported um, and likely many more unreported. Um, and while mass vaccination campaigns are starting to dramatically reduce cases and deaths um, from COVID in high income countries, the limited access to vaccines in much of the world means you know, this death toll is likely to continue to mount um, for at least another year in other parts of the world. But even before COVID, um, infections killed nearly 10 million individuals a year. Uh, so for example, um, despite the availability of highly effective drug therapies for um, HIV, TB, um, hepatitis C, uh, and malaria, uh, together they killed uh, over 3 million people uh, a year in 2019, for example. Um, and vaccine preventable illnesses like meningitis, whooping cough, measles, typhoid, hepatitis B, uh, still kill around a million a year. Diarrheal diseases, which can largely be prevented with proper sanitation and hygiene, killed another 1.5 million. And other respiratory infections um, with similar risk factors uh, to COVID-19 uh, kill around two and a half million. So achieving sort of further um, and equitable reductions in the burden of infectious diseases remains a major public health goal going forward, even after COVID. So individuals uh, tasked with deciding how to optimally treat or control infectious diseases that at the local or global level are often faced with difficult questions. So for example, um, in controlling an epidemic, uh, a public health official might have to decide you know, which sort of businesses or activities might be closed, might need to be closed to reduce transmission, you know, or maybe which groups must be prioritized for vaccination. In treating an individual patient, um, a clinician might have to decide, uh, for example, what's the optimal dose and duration of drug therapy to treat that individual's infection, but also to prevent the development of drug resistance. And these type of questions can be very difficult to uh, get the answers to with experimental methods. So we don't often have parallel universes where um, we can try out different policies or different treatments. Um, and clinical trials can be extremely expensive and time consuming. Often we need to make decisions about how to deal with infectious diseases with incomplete information. So for this reason, um, mathematical models have become a key tool used for decision-making uh, for infectious diseases. So mathematical models, um, I think of them as a way of, of creating a virtual world where we can simulate how an infection might spread under different circumstances. So to make these models, um, researchers classify individuals uh, in this virtual population based on their stage of infection. You know, so for example, whether they're susceptible or infected, symptomatic or asymptomatic, recovered or deceased. They encode uh, rules for determining when individuals might transition between these states. Uh, then these rules get encoded into uh, mathematical equations. Uh, and those equations can be put into a computer program to simulate how an infection might spread and evolve over time. But in order for these models to make useful predictions, they must encode important information um, about the specific disease of interest. So for example, we need to know how a disease is transmitted, how long between when someone is infected and when they become contagious, uh, and how maybe how likely someone is to require hospitalization or how long immunity lasts after infection. And the output of a model is only as good as the input. And so some of the most difficult parts of model building is finding reliable data sources to put into these models. Now, while it might seem like in building these models, um, 
it's mo that it's mostly about you know, learning about the virus or the bacteria or whatever the infection causing agent is, um, which is true. That's important. But in fact, we also have to think a lot about the human factors that impact disease spread and infection outcomes. So, for example, um, disease transmission um, requires direct or indirect contact between people. And so disease spread depends on complex patterns of human social behavior. And on the clinical side, the severity of infection uh, and the health outcomes of people who are infected depends on their access to health care, you know, their acceptance or adherence to treatments, their pre-existing health status or exposures. And so all the diversity and disparities in human populations can manifest as difference in, in the risk of infection and the response to it. And so I'll just walk you through a few specific examples of this that, that we've addressed in our work. So infectious diseases spread over networks of human contacts. And the properties of these networks really depend both on the biology of how a disease is transmitted and on the social behavior of the host, in this case, humans. So for example, uh, a sexually transmitted disease will spread over a different sort of network than a respiratory infection. Some individuals in the network might be highly connected, uh, whereas other individuals might be more isolated or have smaller, uh, more clustered groups of contacts. So the shape of these networks is really important for determining the speed and extent of disease transmission, um, also for determining um, evolution of new disease variants. Uh, so they can be really important for modeling, but unfortunately they're notoriously difficult to measure. So we rarely observe transmission directly. So we have to estimate these networks based on maybe surveys or census data or mobility tracking data sources, or sometimes we try to reconstruct them from contact tracing studies or um, from genetic tracking of the pathogen. So we recently examined contact networks for COVID-19 transmission in the city of Philadelphia uh, to understand disparities in infection risk. So neighborhoods in the city of Philadelphia cluster into a few groups um, based on the demographics and socioeconomic status. Uh, and we found that individuals were much more likely to um, be having contacts with other individuals in their same um, neighborhood type uh, and we also found that some neighborhoods were much more able to reduce their contacts and adopt social distancing measures during um, the worst parts of the epidemic in 2020 compared to those living in other districts. Um, and uh, we found that this uh, means that certain clusters, uh, individuals living in certain clusters of neighborhoods had a much higher risk of infection uh, than others and that the risk sort of stayed high despite the implementation of social distancing policies. Models can also help us understand how social determinants of health, so for example, housing characteristics impact infection risk and how policies might help ameliorate these risks. So for example, um, we've studied the spread of bed bug infestations, which is a neglected urban health concern and that disproportionately affects certain populations. And we found that the prevalence of infestations is tightly linked to the ability to employ kind of costly pest control kind of treatments um, to kind of rid houses of bed bugs uh, and the turnover rate of rental units. Uh, we could actually show that disclosure policies, which are a particular policy um, in which landlords are required to notify tenants of past infestations, um, could be really important in reducing bed bug spread and are cost effective even for landlords in the long term. For COVID-19, um, we know that households actually are a major site of transmission and millions of American households uh, have fell fallen behind on rent over the course of this pandemic and have been at risk of eviction for the past year. Uh, so putting these things together, um, evictions actually can increase the risk of infection, um, but forcing individuals uh, into more crowded housing situations where infections more likely to spread and then kind of spill over to other households in the community. So we were able to estimate how many infections are averted um, by eviction bans, um, which helped local legislatures and the CDC uh, justify putting these measures in place uh, over the past year.
So a very important uh, issue when designing treatment strategies for infections like HIV and TB um, is what dose and combination of drugs should be given to control the infection, um, but also prevent the emergence of drug resistance. And this is another issue um, where human factors become very important. So mathematical models um, can be used uh, both to describe how these infections spread in the body and how um, they then spread to others in the population. And you might think that if you wanted to understand drug resistance, you know, the important factors to consider would be things like how the drug targets the virus or bacteria or how quickly the pathogen mutates uh, to produce new variants. Uh, and those are indeed important, um, but research has shown that uh, patient adherence to medication, so that is the portion of prescribed doses that an individual correctly takes, is one of the major determinants of whether drug resistance emerges while someone is taking therapy. So around the world, for many different reasons, people tend to regularly miss doses of their drugs, especially if they have to take a lot of pills for extended periods of time, and if there's a stigma against infection, or if they just start to feel better. And I'm sure if you've ever tried to stick to a regimen of vitamins, you yourself have experienced this. So drug doses are designed to kind of be low enough to prevent toxicity, but kind of high enough to stay at therapeutic levels um, between doses. But when doses are missed, drug levels can drop. Um, this can allow um, the pathogen, the virus or the bacteria to replicate and to produce potentially drug resistant mutations, um, which could then take over and cause therapy failure. So models that include this human behavioral aspect of treatment can explain patterns of resistance um, to different types of therapies and allow us to make predictions about treatment regimens that might reduce resistance risk, even if adherence isn't perfect. Uh, so just to wrap up, um, mathematical models are a really important tool to help us predict the spread of infections and design better control strategies. Uh, they have to encode what we know about the biology, the clinical side, the epidemiological side of an infection, but human behavior and the heterogeneities in that behavior are a really important component of infection risk, and they can also be incorporated into models. So all in there, um, feel free to reach out or check out some other resources um, that we have here. Great. Well, thanks very much, Allison, uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, for our audience today, I'm Alex Kolodkin. I'm the Deputy Director of the Institute for Basic Biomedical Sciences, and I'll be introducing the next few speakers. So we can start off with uh, questions for Allison. And uh, while we're waiting for them to appear, um, a wonderful talk, and it's really encouraging to see how these sorts of mathematical models can uh, inform our approach to our approach to uh, disease treatment. I'm wondering if there have been some very recent advances um, coming from the modeling of COVID-19, which I realize is, is quite uh, is quite current. Um, but how the modeling for this pandemic, in terms of human behavior, may be informing uh, right now um, how you might consider approaches to other diseases, both respiratory and non-respiratory. Absolutely. So one thing that's really been different during this pandemic is the availability of um, mobility data um, from anonymous cell phone um, records that help us understand how often people are interacting and how that changes in response to different policies. That's really not a data stream that was widely available before. Um, so that's been very helpful. Um, and um, in addition, uh, given the sort of the high amounts of just case and death and hospitalization data that's come in, I think from the computational side, developing algorithms that can really fit models to those data. So train the models to be able to reproduce what was already happening so they can make better forecasts. I think that has certainly improved uh, as well. And I think also in terms of the communication of models, scientists have had to be uh, doing this a lot more commonly, communicating their results to the public. And hopefully I think you know, many of us have improved at that over this time. Yeah. And in regards to that, I'm um, thinking about the way in which um, sort of fairly straightforward uh, phone technologies can be used in, um, you know, through across the world and perhaps in areas that are not um, as, uh, as developed. Um, I'm wondering if some of the strategies you've been uh, looking at um, are applicable um, to these sorts of situations, uh, places where, in fact, the infrastructure may not be as great, but at least people may have access to some of these uh, communication technologies. 
Yeah, absolutely. So actually, um, sort of one of the pioneers in this field of using mobility data to track infections is um, one of my colleagues in the epidemiology department at the, the public health school here, Amy Wesolowski, and she's been using cell phone data from, you know, very rural areas of Africa to understand the spread of malaria um, for years now. So um, certainly, uh, you know, this, this type of data can be used anywhere that, that people are using mobile phones, which is basically everywhere now. Great. Um, so I don't see any questions in the Q&A, any, any additional questions. Um, if people have uh, additional questions uh, for Allison, uh, please feel free to contact her. And, uh, and again, thanks very much, Allison, for a wonderful talk.